Good morning, and welcome to our online worship service for Sunday, April 26, 2020, the third Sunday of Easter. Our silent meditation for this morning is, What's the furthest ahead you have ever planned something? And in that context, I should mention that uh, our church consistories have decided, as you know, not to have any activities through the end of April. And with the governor's new stay-at-home orders extending through May 8th, we'll be meeting again, consistories, or discussing again, to decide what our next steps will be. Please do be assured that whenever we do reopen for church, we will be doing so in a very careful manner. We are trying very hard to think through everything that we need to do differently, some things that we'll need to avoid doing, and some things that we'll simply need to postpone for a while. Please continue to be in prayer for all of your sisters and brothers at church that we can stay safe and stay well. Let us begin our worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let's join now in our hymn of praise. Remember that we are still in the Easter season, so it is perfectly appropriate to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. And so today we join in singing, Christ Arose. join now in a special profession of faith that draws our attention to God's incredible plans for our salvation. Together we say, We believe in an infinite God who has loved us since the foundation of the world. From the first moment of human rebellion, a plan was set in motion to reconcile us to our Creator. Centuries in the making, the plan for our salvation was fully realized in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our God. This work of reconciliation continues through the Church and with the power of the Holy Spirit, until the time when all who welcome God's love 
are gathered up into the fullness of eternal life in heaven. And let us join now in our call to worship. Followers of Jesus Christ, by his cross we are redeemed from the futility of sin. Alleluia. By his rising, we are free from the fear of death. Alleluia. By his love, we enter into God's eternal plan for our salvation. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. And join me now in the spirit of prayer. Jesus, our guide, you explained the scriptures and revealed yourself to the disciples at Emmaus. Now, by your spirit, enlighten our minds to understand their witness and ignite our hearts to receive you wherever we encounter you. Amen. Now, right now, some of us are still so used to going from day to day <laughs> that we're having trouble planning for a week's worth of grocery shopping in one shot. Now, imagine trying to understand God's eternal plan for our salvation, revealed in Jesus Christ when the time was right. But more than the awe we might feel at such a monumental plan, more than that, is the unworthiness we feel that God would do all of this for us. Let us now admit our concerns to God. We join together in our prayer of confession. Awesome God, we stand on the outside of your eternal plans and we admit we are amazed. Tracing back to Adam and Eve, you have worked bit by bit through human history to create a world, then a people, then a culture, so that your son could arrive and do your will in just the right way at just the right time. We are amazed, but we also feel very unworthy. We know who we really are, and we know the things we have done in our lives. And you know all this, too. But lest we miss the gift that you offer, we humbly confess our failings and gladly accept your forgiveness. Thank you, risen Savior. Amen. Let us take a few moments now for silent reflection and personal prayer. An ancient plan emerging slowly out of the depths of time, more than we can imagine, and way more than we deserve. And yet, it is given to us. In fact, it was designed for us. In God's plan, we are forgiven, and we are saved. And so we say, thank you, God, as we strive to do better. Amen. We come to the time where we gather our prayers as a family of faith. And of course, since we are gathered online, we're not listing any particular prayers right now. But please do take a moment for silent prayer, knowing that our Lord hears our joys and our concerns. Let's do that now. Amen. And don't forget, you can always contact our prayer groups. For St. Paul's, it would be Ruth Coppenhaver for the prayer chain. And for Salem, it would be Carolyn Cocker for the prayers of the faithful. Please do let them know of anything that needs prayer. 
and that will be passed along to all the folks in that group, and we will pray for that. And gracious God, we give you thanks that you do hear our prayers. We thank you that you hear, you respond according to your wisdom and your mercy and your timing. Amen. And let us join today in a special prayer for healing. Prayer in the time of coronavirus. Together we say, Holy Jesus, in this time of COVID-19, we need your presence with us on the road. The long road between fear and hope. The road between the place where all is lost and the place of resurrection and life again. Like the disciples walking the road to Emmaus, we need to feel your presence with us. Stand among us, Jesus, in your resurrection glory and bring your healing power. Amen. And let us also join in the prayer that our Savior taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. I would ask our young people to gather around the screen if they're not there already. And again, I have a picture to share with you and a story. So you see two pictures on the screen. You see a boy running, and you also see someone with their arm in a sling. <laughs> well, this is a story about me when I was in second grade. We were out at recess, and I think it was just the boys that played this game. We would all lock arms and run down a hill together, one big long line. And then at the bottom, there'd be some other boys standing like this, trying to break up the line. Yeah, well, what can I tell you? Well, this particular time, um, it, we didn't even get halfway down the hill when somebody tripped or stumbled, and we ended up in a rolling, sliding, tumbling mass of boys going down the hill. And by the time we got to the bottom, my right arm was broken, right here at the shoulder. And I had to go to the doctor and to the hospital and ended up with my arm in a sling for several weeks. Now here's the point of the story. Okay, yeah, that was not such a good idea, granted. But when we went out to recess, I was not planning on breaking my arm. I was planning to have a good time with all the other kids at recess. What I planned and what happened were two totally different things. So having fun at recess, that was my plan A. But God had a plan B for me. When plan A didn't work because I broke my arm, God arranged for me to get medical help, but also because now I couldn't carry my books or my book bag, the teacher assigned another boy in class, his name was Craig, she assigned him to help me carry things to, to class and also from the car or bus or whatever. Well, part of plan B from God that I didn't know about was this other boy, Craig, became one of my first best friends all the way through elementary school. Again, I didn't plan it that way, but God was able to do something wonderful anyhow. What I want you to remember is you may plan things, how you're going to spend your day and of course, right now, when it's all stay at home, it feels like our plans are limited. 
But whatever your plans are, even if something changes, look for something good that God may bring about. Because I guarantee this, even in the worst of times, God always has a plan B for us. We turn now to our reading of Scripture. And our first reading comes from the book of the Acts of the Apostles. In chapter 2, we read verse 14a, and then verses 36 through 41. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. We turn next to our reading from Peter's first letter, 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 17 through 23. If you invoke as father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and your hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. And next we turn to our reading from the Gospel. Today we hear from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. This is the story of the road to Emmaus. And this happens the same night as Resurrection Sunday, the same day that Jesus rose from the dead. This is later that day and into the evening. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. 
Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening up the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Well, then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Here end our readings for this morning. Our message for this morning is called Plan B, and I would invite you to join me for a moment of prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, I never made it to Boy Scouts. I was a Cub Scout, but at the end of that, that's where I stopped. But that did not stop me from trying to live up to the Boy Scout motto, be prepared. As a matter of fact, the U.S. Coast Guard has a similar motto, Semper Paratus, meaning always prepared. And I've always tried to plan for whatever might happen. So when I went to college and I liberated myself, I got myself a man bag, <clears throat> basically a square boxy purse. But it wasn't a purse, it was a man bag because of the things I carried in it. And I wanted to make sure I was prepared for any possibility. Now, keep in mind, I only commuted 20 minutes to college. And I spent my time either in class or doing research and reading in, in the college library or working part-time at the Subway sandwich shop. <clears throat> so what kind of emergencies could I run into? But I was prepared. So in my man bag, I had, I had a compass, just in case I'd ever get lost, way before the days of GPS. I had a small pocket Bible, so that I would always have the Word of God close to me. Oh, but I didn't stop there. <clears throat> Let's see, I had a folding plastic shoehorn. I had a miniature sewing kit. I had a Swiss Army knife. I also had uh, one of those other uh, hand tools, those multi-tools, because Swiss Army knives don't include everything. I had a survival saw wire, one of those things you can saw wood with just in case. I had, they were fashionable back then, a blank book, which I used as a diary. I had scotch tape. I had a lighter. I had matches. I had my soprano recorder. It came in pieces so I could take it apart and fit it in there. And the creme de la creme. I had a small pocket mirror 
Why? Just in case I ever got lost on a mountain, I could use it to reflect sunlight and signal the helicopters so that they'd see me and rescue me. There were no mountains between me and the university, by the way. But I was prepared. I don't know as I ever used any of the things in there except maybe the Swiss Army knife and the Bible and my recorder. But I was ready. I was prepared for whatever might happen. Funny thing, years later, when I worked in telecommunications, one of my responsibilities was disaster recovery, where you plan for any possible contingency and then figure out how you would work around that so that the phone lines and the network and everything else would still work. And you know what? There was a time that we had a genuine disaster with the phone lines. And guess what? That disaster had the nerve, the nerve, to not happen in any of the ways that we had prepared for. Yep, so we were still stuck. Robert Burns, the Scottish poet, does say, The best laid plans of mice and men oft go awry. <laughs> and they certainly do. We look today at God's plans. God's plans are much more complicated. Now, the first plan, plan A for humanity, was actually pretty simple. Plan A was create humanity, put them in a garden. They can live there and enjoy it forever, and they can enjoy being close to God. Perfect plan. Adam and Eve in the garden. Well, plan A lasted about as long as it takes to eat one apple. Now, we don't really know what kind of food it was, but you know what I'm getting at. That's all it took, that one act of pride and rebellion, listening to a snake, who was really Satan, listening to him instead of listening to God, and they're out. God evicts them, banishes them from the garden. Plan A is kaput. But notice this, even at that very moment, God is putting plan B into motion. Because we see that God provides clothing for Adam and Eve. And also, we hear the very first promise, prophecy, if you will, of the coming of a Messiah. When God is talking to the snake and condemning the snake, he says, you and the descendants of the woman will be at enmity with each other. God says, the, the heir of the woman will strike at your head while you strike at his heel. We now put that in prophetic context, and what do we have? The heir of the woman, Jesus, born of a woman, would indeed strike at the head of Satan. That was the beginning of plan B, to once again reconcile us back to God for all who would choose to be reconciled. And we see this plan moving and developing through history. We go from Adam and Eve, from all people, and then it starts to get narrowed down. Through Noah, the plan survives the flood. And then it goes to a particular person again, Abraham, a particular person, a particular tribe, a particular family, from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to the people of Israel. Plan B survives a famine, 400 years of slavery in Egypt, survives the exodus, then blossoms under David and Solomon in the Promised Land. Then the plan survives the kingdom's dividing. The plan survives rebellions. The plan survives exile in Babylon. The plan survives coming back. And now at the time of Jesus, the plan is still in place now with Israel under Roman occupation. 
And throughout the centuries, as the plan has progressed, the prophets have declared with greater and greater precision about this coming Messiah, the one who would set everything right again. Until that one special night, when angels declare to some, sh to some shepherds, this day is born to you in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Plan B is coming into fulfillment. Now, of course, there are a lot of things along the way that could have messed it up. Abraham could have said no. The, uh, the people of Israel in exile in Babylon could have said, yeah, you know what? We don't need to go back to Jerusalem. Babylon's not such a bad place. Mary could have said, nah, not interested in being the mother of the Savior of the world. Even once Jesus was born, what if Herod's soldiers had caught them before they fled to Egypt? Or even in Jesus' adult ministry, there were many times when people threatened him even people from his own hometown. What if he had been injured or died then, before the right time and the right place, which of course was Calvary and the cross? There were many things that could have messed up plan B, but thankfully plan B is fulfilled. We hear those three words from the cross, it is finished. They might not have meant anything to some of the folks there that day, but for believers, they understood something incredibly powerful had just happened. And that word finished, in the Greek, it is tetelestai. It doesn't mean just finished like done. It also means completed, brought to fullness, fulfilled. And that is exactly what happened. At that moment, plan B was fulfilled through Jesus' life and death, well, and of course the resurrection. Justice is served, the debt is paid, heaven's gates are opened once again for all who choose to enter. It is finished and it opens up everything for us. This is why we can hear from Scripture such powerful things. We hear First Peter, where Peter says, He was destined from the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. This plan B had started way, way, way back, and now it had been fulfilled. This is why Jesus can say, to the folks walking to Emmaus, and remember, they didn't know who it was at that moment. He says to them, Oh, how foolish you are! How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared! Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer all these things and then enter into his glory? And Jesus explains how his coming, his suffering, all of that had been laid out in God's plans and had been spoken of by the prophets. And even when we hear in the book of Acts, where Peter's proclaiming to all the people the good news of Jesus Christ, and it says, you talk about church growth, 3,000 were added to their number that day. Now, of course, Scripture doesn't tell us about other people, because Acts of the Apostles says, those who welcomed his message. So, okay, 3,000 people welcomed Peter's message. Who knows how many didn't? But therein lies the issue. Who does and who doesn't welcome the message of salvation through Jesus Christ? Because, you see, plan A had this fatal flaw. God gave Adam and Eve free will. He let them choose. 
And as the old Pepsi commercial goes, they chose poorly. Yes, they chose very poorly, unwisely. Well, plan B has the same fatal flaw. Free will is still included in the package. And that's because God loves us. God does not want a bunch of robots who have to choose to follow God. God doesn't want people who choose God simply because they're terrified of God. No, God wants flesh and blood human beings who freely choose to love God, who want to love God. That free will, those who welcomed Peter's message. Now friends, by the grace, the saving grace of God, we have been saved as believers. We have been forgiven. We have been saved. Our eternal destiny is taken care of. But still, each and every day, maybe each and every moment, there are little decisions, decisions in the details, where we still have that free will and have to choose, do we want to go God's way or not? The more we choose God's way, the closer we get to God, the more fellowship we sense with God. And I pray that each of us does that so that at the end of our lives, we'll be able to look back at how plan B affected us and we'll be able to say, along with God, I love it when a plan comes together. Amen. Yes, indeed, Jesus, Peter, and countless others, down through the ages, have set our hearts on fire as they have revealed God's plans of mercy and love and salvation for us. We are encouraged to respond with our generosity and gratitude. And I, again, am so grateful and delighted to share that so many of you continue to respond with your offerings, sending them by mail, dropping them off at the church. It is very much appreciated and puts us in good standing for the time when we are able to gather and more fully complete the many ministries that we have to do together. This helps keep us going. So let us join together in a prayer of dedication. Like the disciples of Emmaus, we offer what we have. They offered their company, their table, their bread. We invite you to be with us, Lord Jesus, as we offer you our love, our devotion, and these gifts. May our eyes be opened to your holy presence among us now and always. Amen. So let us go now as those who have met with Christ in the morning of this day. Let us go now as those whose hearts have burned within them as scriptures have been explained. And let us go now as those who have been drawn into the depths of time and into the deep mystery of God's eternal plans. And may the blessing of God be upon you, body, mind, and spirit, this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>